Welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. My name is Carl Stitchen, and I'm the director of IELTS. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the director's series of seminars, a monthly remote workshop on the Institute calendar. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure today to welcome our Associate Research Fellow at IELTS, Dr. Francis Boorman. Francis studied history, politics, and political philosophy at the University of York. He has a PhD from the Institute of Historical Research here in the School of Advanced Study at the University. His thesis was on the social and political history of Chancery Lane in the 18th century. His research interests include the histories of arbitration, the legal profession, and London, as well as local, social, and political history. Francis worked with the late Professor Derek Roebuck, a senior associate research fellow at IELTS, on the History of Arbitration Project. He began in 2013 initially as a research assistant for Derek's books, the Golden Age of Arbitration, Dispute Resolution under Elizabeth I, published in 2015, and Arbitration and Mediation in 17th Century England, published in 2017. Uh, Francis then co-authored with Derek Roebuck and Rhiannon Marklis the volume English Arbitration and Mediation in the Long 18th Century, which was published in 2019. Thanks to the generosity of the supporters of this research, IELTS has been able to fund the completion of the project, and we are delighted that Francis has taken up the challenge of continuing to work on the 19th century history of arbitration. Francis's paper today is entitled The History of Arbitration, Legislation and Practice. He will speak for about 50 minutes and questions can be raised by our audience members in the Q&A function at any time. After the close of Francis's paper, I will attempt to moderate the questions in the discussion period. The seminar is scheduled for 90 minutes. So with that by way of introduction, I'm very pleased to welcome Francis to uh, the director series. And Francis, uh, over to you now. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Carl, and for inviting me uh, to speak today. Uh, it's a real pleasure um, to be able to share this research. And I should reiterate the, the thanks you gave to all the contributors to the History of Arbitration Project. It's a, a real honour to be able to carry on and I hope speak to the research interests of um, both Derek Roebuck and Johnny Vida today. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be addressing the history of arbitration um, with reference particularly to uh, the legislation that was brought about over the course of around 200 years um, and also looking at how that compared uh, with some different practices of arbitration. Um, so most scholarship concerning the history of arbitration tends to focus on its relationship with two communities, that of lawyers and merchants. Legislators have also appeared to share that approach, speaking largely of the effect new arbitration laws would have on commerce and the courts. Today, I will describe the major legislation that affected the practice of arbitration during the two centuries following the Arbitration Act of 1698 and the ways that historians have come to understand that legislation. I will then go on to discuss a wider ecosystem of arbitration, although largely concentrating on uses of arbitration sanctioned by Parliament as clauses buried in within legislation pertaining to areas like the enclosure of common land and the railway industry. Patrick Hattier has observed that this profusion of administrative law, which burgeoned in the 19th century, has not much, been not much commented on, either at the time by politicians and journalists or since. And that's partly because uh, people have been convinced by the supremacy of laissez-faire government in the 19th century. Lawyers, meanwhile, were not much involved in its administration, which fell to a new army of bureaucrats. This perhaps goes some way to explaining why historians of arbitration have only showed a passing interest. I will go on to suggest that a working class culture of 
using arbitration to resolve disputes also existed, um, and that had a rather uneasy relationship with state control and the legal system. And first, I'm going to suggest how arbitration changed over the course of 200 years via a five minute walk down Fleet Street and the Strand on the edge of the City of London. And as you can see, we're going to start here in the pub, specifically Ye Old Cheshire Cheese, which was rebuilt shortly after the Great Fire of London. It is now the latter part of the 17th century when an arbitration might take place in a pub or tavern just like this one, and perhaps even a room which we could find inside the old Cheshire cheese still. The basic structure was for parties in dispute to agree to go to arbitration instead of the costly and slow process of litigation, and let's say in our case, two merchants. One might have sent the other a shipment of wine on credit, but they disagreed about the quality and therefore the price. They would begin by drawing up an indenture, and I have an example here, that set out the terms and remit of the arbitration. Each merchant chose an arbitrator who might be a friend or colleague. In our case, they would naturally appoint other merchants with experience in the wine trade. The parties then generally signed arbitration bonds, and this is an exemplar bond uh, for which you can fill in the names and dates um, of the uh, particular dispute involved. And a bond would oblige the parties to forfeit a sum of money if they did not comply with the award of the arbitrators, which would typically be a penal amount of double the amount in dispute, so that refusing to perform the award was not a viable option. The two arbitrators then attempted to come to an agreement over all matters in dispute. They would hear any relevant evidence from witnesses and examine accounts, and would no doubt have the arduous task of tasting the wine. They then made their award, or if they still couldn't agree, they would have a nominated another merchant as umpire, and his decision would be final. For our merchants, he ordered a price for the wine, and then said when the money should be paid, uh, perhaps coming in several instalments. Now let's take a five minute walk to the west and simultaneously leap forward 200 years to the building of the Royal Courts of Justice, that Victorian Gothic edifice still overlooking the Strand that some of you may be familiar with. And here it is in all its glory. Um, and as part of the design for this building, the architect George, Ed George Edmund Street included detailed features for an arbitration room, where when it opened in 1882, two parties might have their reference heard by an official referee, a barrister appointed by the Lord Chancellor. I think this symbolism is quite significant, the arbitration process finding its very own space at the heart of the legal system. I want to describe the legislative changes that signposted this short journey from tavern to law court, with the inevitable caveat that it wasn't quite as short or as simple as it might first appear. So if I can return you now to the mid 17th century, when the Court of King's Bench provided a method for enforcing agreements to arbitrate, they could be entered as a rule of court, which made the failure to perform an award a contempt of court that resulted in attachment or imprisonment. The procedure to register could either begin with the submission to the court of an existing agreement to arbitrate or as a reference to arbitration from the court where an action had already been initiated. The first legislation relating to arbitration was the Arbitration Act of 1698, which was set in motion by the newly established Board of Trade and drawn up by philosopher John Locke to legislate for the existing rule of court procedure. Locke explicitly stated that the Arbitration Act was intended to aid the smooth functioning of trade, although it was not much called upon for over half a century. Court-backed arbitrations became more popular from the 1750s, and it's worth noting that significant legalisation of the arbitration process took place via its increasing interaction with the courts and the common law, uh, without any further intervention from Parliament taking place for quite some time. In fact, the next act specifically pertaining to arbitration was not passed until William IV was on the throne in 1833. Much of the impetus 
for reforming arbitration law during the mid-19th century came from Henry Brougham, Baron Brougham from 1830 and Lord Chancellor between 1830 and 1834. However, his vision of a comprehensive system of public arbitration, including a court of arbitration as some other European countries had, was never realised. An arbitration bill was introduced as one of several law reform bills by Lord Chief Justice Tenterden in 1832, but he died soon afterwards and the bill was lost with him. It contained several provisions that were not enacted until much later, including giving judges the power to compel a reference to arbitration in matters of account and to compel arbitrators to state a special case if the arbitration turned on a matter of law, to be heard by jury if a matter of fact was involved. It would have allowed arbitrators to have their award entered as a judgment and the court to revoke a submission under the Act. Instead, far more limited new provisions for arbitration to Brown's Single Civil Procedure Act of 1833, notably losing the compulsory arbitration clause. Submissions to arbitration registered as a rule of court were made irrevocable unless by consent of the court, and arbitrators appointed by rule of court or order of court could compel the attendance of witnesses and administer oaths, meaning any false testimony would be perjury. The application of these provisions was slightly uncertain and seemed limited to references from the common law courts. When a reference was made from chancery, the arbitrator could not, in the eyes of some at least, compel witnesses to attend. Further reform would take another two decades. Lord Brougham introduced another bill to overhaul the law relating to arbitration in 1852, but it was overtaken by wider legal reforms and again more limited provisions were passed. The arbitration clauses in the Common Law Procedure Act of 1854 allowed the court or judge to refer cases relating wholly or partly to matters of account to arbitration before they came to trial, with the option to appoint a recently created county court judge as arbitrator. If the parties to an arbitration required it, a question of law or fact from an arbitration could be decided in court. Arbitrators could issue an award in whole or part as a special case to be decided by the court. An arbitration agreement was made sufficient cause to stay proceedings. And if the parties failed to appoint an arbitrators or an umpire, then a judge could do so on their behalf. And if one party failed to appoint an arbitrator, then the arbitrator appointed by the other party could act alone. All awards could be made a rule of court unless explicit provision was made to the contrary. Finally, the ambiguity surrounding awards which ordered the transfer of land was removed. Henceforth, a rule of court registering an award ordering the transfer of land would have the effect of a judgment in ejectment. Um, So much stronger um, backing for arbitration agreements from the courts from 1854 onwards. The Judicature Commission acknowledged the ongoing popularity of arbitration in the 1860s, but identified ongoing problems. They found that arbitrations were generally referred to a barrister or an expert. Barristers were likely to have other commitments and might repeatedly adjourn hearings, causing long delays. Experts lacked enough knowledge of legal proceedings and rules of evidence. The arbitrator set his own charges, making arbitration expensive. And finally, there was no appeal or remedy unless the arbitrator acted particularly egregiously. The Judicature Act of 1873 set up government officers called official referees who were appointed by the Lord Chancellor, a system of patronage which the barrister and MP Henry Matthews, to quote, looked upon with the greatest dread and dislike. The newly established High Court, Court of Appeal, or any divisional court could refer causes to them for inquiry and report, then accept this in part or whole and enforce it as a judgment. Matters to quote the Act, prolonged examination of documents or accounts, or any scientific or local investigation could be referred to an official referee or a special referee chosen by the parties. The set cost of official referees was £5 for a reference, with further charges for every hour above two days' work and for every night spent away from London. So the 
complete codification of law relating to arbitration was then attempted in the 1880s. Lord Bramwell, in with the backing of the Council of the London Chamber of Commerce in 1884, who saw it as a precondition to establishing the London Court of National Arbitration, which was eventually founded, but only in 1892. Like Brown's earlier efforts, Bramwell's bill was overtaken by an alternative, drafted by Parliamentary Council and with the more modest aim of consolidating existing legislation, despite opposition against it amongst the business community. Nevertheless, the Arbitration Act of 1889 was passed and repealed all the relevant clauses from the five previous acts that made general amendments to the law relating to arbitration, uh, most of which I've described here and were passed in 1698, 1833, 1854, 1873 and 1884, uh, the final one slightly glossed over. Uh, rather than providing much that was innovative, the 1889 Act is perhaps more notable for offering consistency, certainty, and even decisiveness that the judiciary had not quite managed to provide previously. The jurisdiction of courts to review awards, either on the merits or on a point of law, was ambiguous at best for much of the 19th century. But there was an increasing use of judicial review and confidence in setting aside awards on procedural grounds, particularly after 1854. Following the 1889 Act, judicial review of awards was entrenched, registration with the courts presumed, and even a complete process provided, unless it was explicitly rejected in the arbitration agreement. The standard was for a single arbitrator to make an award within three months. The ability to compel arbitrators to state a case swept aside the persistent confusion about whether an award could be reviewed at all, but especially on a point of law. Uh, now, I've run through that quite quickly and packed in uh, quite a lot of information on that legislation um, because actually quite recently, uh, Stavros Brekalakis has summarised this um, and he very usefully um, relates all of this legislation and then also the overturning of a myth that the judiciary were hostile to arbitration. Um, I won't go into that myth further here, uh, but it has been one of the important developments in the historiography of arbitration, I suppose, in the last three decades or so. Um, I really want to examine Brekalakis's uh, arguments uh, slightly more closely instead. So he sees each stage of legislation as an improvement, although I recognise that in many ways this isn't really his main focus, his ultimate aim being to argue against the view of arbitration as a relatively recent neoliberal project. However, he does state that, to quote, despite the remarkable success of the Lock Act, a large number of arbitration agreements, namely agreements under the common law, were not protected against revocation. This was corrected later in the 19th century when the Common Law Procedure Act of 1854 was enacted. In Brekalakis's telling, legislation had finally given proper protection to arbitration agreements and each stage of legislation improved the overall process. I just want to uh, present two critiques of this view. Firstly, the reasons for introducing reform do not encourage a straightforward story of improvement. In a reassessment of the 1698 Arbitration Act questioning its necessity and legacy, Julia Kelso has shown in her recent thesis that legislation was not introduced to solve a problem relating to enforcement of awards using penal bonds, as previous legal historians had presumed. It was not in fact a response that had been sought by merchants and did not really answer any legal need. Instead, it was most likely considered a simpler alternative to creating a merchant court and an attempt by members of the Board of Trade, including John Locke, to secure the very existence of the newly created board. This helps to explain why merchants were continuing to call for such a court nearly a century later, and also why the enforcement procedure of the Arbitration Act was not much used, only becoming really widespread in the King's Bench in the 1770s under Lord Mansfield. Kelso's work strengthens the view that the legalisation of arbitration 
was not so much a teleological process, but often somewhat incidental. The motivation of legislators were complex and tactical, involving party politics and personal animosity. Procedural considerations in Parliament were sometimes vital, and above all, legislators were generally trying to catch up with trends that were already underway. We have seen that attempts to codify arbitration law by Lords Brougham and Bramwell were rejected in favour of introducing changes that were mostly grouped with other legal reforms. So not only had legal professionals become the prime movers in reforming arbitration, that reform became entangled with changes to the courts and the legal system. Johnny Veder and Brian Dye have written about how both courts and Parliament took, to quote, a piecemeal pragmatic approach to arbitration, resulting in statutes that, to quote again, were mainly concerned with the relationship between the English courts and the arbitral process. Voices from business were, as with Locke's Act, unsuccessful at having their own suggestions enacted. In the 19th century, tribunals of commerce were set in some political and business circles as a potential forum for set of commercial disputes that combine the advantages of arbitration and the courts, but the almost unanimous hostility of the legal profession made sure they had little support for a commission. Instead, the resulting Act of 1873 provided for arbitration, selected arbitrators selected from and controlled by the legal profession. Although they never received legislative backing, private commercial tribunals became increasingly popular. Harry Arthurs has identified a separate worldview in the commercial community to the legal profession, which they used as the basis for arbitration tribunals, maintaining de facto independence from the law. He identifies this as both an economic and ideological threat to the legal profession. He contrasts the settled and universal justice of lawyers with the discretionary and particular justice favoured by commerce, which valued results over process. Arthurs describes how arbitration was captured by the courts in the 19th century, becoming increasingly legalised and submitting increasingly to legal norms. The second critique of the narrative of improvement follows from the position that arbitration was captured, that strengthening the enforcement of arbitrations by the courts came at the cost of any independence from the legal system and much of the flexibility that had been a dwindling advantage of arbitration for centuries. Douglas Yarn describes this process of, to quote, isomorphism through institutionalization as the death of alternative dispute resolution. His concern is for the loss of the conciliatory elements of arbitration, replacing it with an adversarial process in the image of the legal system. The aspects of arbitration identified by lawyers at the time and some legal historians since as problems of enforcement, Yarn instead describes as the very basis of a consensual process with a conciliatory approach. These three aspects were, firstly, voluntary submission to arbitration, secondly, the ability of parties to revoke an agreement to arbitrate, and thirdly, the control of parties over the proceedings. Revocation in particular came to be seen as a problem that needed to be fixed rather than the right of a consenting party and was incrementally eliminated in the 19th century. Jan also identifies the move from having to opt in to registering an arbitration with the courts to having to opt out as another erosion of consent. The Arbitration Act of 1889 made the rule of court procedure universal, completing the transformation of arbitration into an adjudicative and coercive process. The institutional of our institutionalization of arbitration by commercial organizations compounded these legal reforms, adding further inflexibility through the control they had over their members and their use of form contracts. Is it then correct to say that arbitration was captured by the courts while political dominance of the legal process, of the political process, sorry? And did the commercial community collude in or resist legalisation? 
I would suggest the term capture is perhaps too strong and suggestive of greater planning and agency than the evidence admits. The legislative reform of arbitration occurred rather haphazardly, and it was simply the way in which it was conceived by the legal profession and included in legal reforms that resulted in its becoming subordinate to the courts, a development that was accidentally aided and abetted by a parallel process of institutionalization in a business community that was only developing its own processes due to dissatisfaction with Parliament's refusal to grant powers its own. If business could not beat the law by having a parallel state-backed arbitration institution, it was eventually willing to join it by having all arbitration agreements, whether private or organised through institutions like Chambers of Commerce, enforced by the courts. In resolving arbitration's relationship with the legal system, it was increasingly made a part of that system, and thus its failures became part of that paradigm. While much more could be said about the role of the common law, as well as chambers of commerce and the path not taken by Parliament in handing them greater powers for deciding disputes, I want today to focus on the areas in which arbitration was sanctioned by legislation, which didn't necessarily concern the courts or merchants, but were vitally important to structural changes in the British economy. And for that, we must leave London, which I think is an important element, and uh, tramp around the fields of England, down to the Cornish canals, then back north via the railways to finally end up in a different pub with the curiously named Manchester Oddfellows. So there were many arbitration clauses that were inserted in a variety of acts. And one of the first areas in which arbitration was routinely sanctioned by legislators in Parliament was the enclosure of common land. And you can see an enclosure map drawn out uh, here. Enclosure was the process by which the open fields system of agriculture was abolished. The ownership of open fields, commons and wastes was swept aside and the land reappeared portioned according to the relative value of rights previously held in that land. This could be achieved by general agreement, reference to commissioners or arbitrators, or by private act of parliament. The appointment of commissioners or arbitrators to parcel out wasteland and decide disputes relating to the commutation of tithes were also frequent features of private enclosure acts. Enclosure by private act began in the 17th century, became systematic in the 18th century and reached its apogee in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Arbitration was often included in acts as the specified form of dispute resolution, sometimes sanctioning the process after the fact of it taking place. A first General Enclosure Act was introduced in 1801, although its effect was limited, and in this case it did not mention arbitration at all. The process of enclosure required a huge number of administrators who became an ad hoc bureaucracy privately employed. The position of commissioner is thought to have developed from that of arbitrator. It's hardly surprising then that commissioners or anyone appointed by private act to enclose lands and commute tides performed, to quote the great 19th century authority on arbitration, Francis Russell, duties in many respects analogous to those of arbitrators. They were in fact sometimes styled as arbitrators. A distinction between the two became more necessary in acts which assigned separate roles to commissioners and arbitrators. The commissioners were tasked with carrying out the initial allotment of lands and the arbitrators following up on specific aspects of an enclosure that remained in dispute. Enclosure commissioners had some technical distinctions in their role that also set them apart from a standard arbitrator. Awards made under the Act of, under Act of Parliament had the power of conveyance, unlike those made under a submission. General acts relating to enclosure developed these distinctions further. The Enclosure Act of 1821 specified the right of appeal against the award of an enclosure commissioner in the courts, in contrast to the usual conception of the arbitrator's award as final. A further General Enclosure Act passed in 1836 returned primacy to the method of enclosure by agreement if two thirds of those affected by an enclosure, both in number and in value, could reach a settlement. 
commissioners could then be appointed without the need for an act of parliament. And if four fifths of proprietors could agree, they could give the commissioners a complete plan or general set of rules to work to. The General Enclosure Act of 1845 created a permanent salaried body of commissioners who could approve enclosure awards. Right of appeal was by action in a feigned issue, either against the person in whose favour the commissioner's determination fell or against commissioners themselves. Specific provision was made for any such dispute to be referred to arbitration and the commissioners could require the parties to give security for payment of costs. So arbitration in enclosure continued well into the 1880s and in an enclosure of common land at Retire in Cornwall, pictured here, uh, in 1885, division and allotment of lands was referred to the arbitration of one Sylvanus Jenkin, and he was a civil engineer uh, from the town of Liscard. He was also asked to set out roads for public use and a boundary hedge, and for his troubles, he was to be paid £60. The agreement would be made a rule in the Supreme Court of Judicature. Enclosure was a legislative precedent, though not acknowledged at the time, of other major transfers of land that relied on arbitration as a mechanism for solving disputes. The canal network in England was built up from the late 18th century. Construction of a canal required a private act of parliament, and these often included arbitration clauses relating to compensation for compulsory land purchases or damages done to land by works surrounding the canal, such as drainage and disputes over water usage with other businesses that relied on local waterways. And that could be anything from a chemical plant to a mill. Arbitration clauses inserted in private acts continued to represent a method by which the competing interests affected by canal construction could be kept at arm's length from the state if disputes arose. An Act of 1825, which sanctioned construction of a canal in Cornwall, allowed for the appointment of arbitrators by the canal company and the mayor and corporation of Lost Withiel in case of injury to the navigation or other use of the river Fowey. If the company failed to appoint an arbitrator or umpire within 20 days, then the sheriff of Cornwall could do so on their behalf. Um, so the local government bureaucracy there uh, being called into action. In yet another case, the area of land needed by the railways was really of another order to that of canals. A railway historian, Mark Casson, is perhaps ideally situated to see the importance of land in the Victorian economy, but also the role that government played in deciding its distribution. He writes, many of the major in Victorian Britain involved the compulsory acquisition of land. Far from defending individual property rights unequivocally, government presided over a system in which large amounts of private land were acquired subject to arbitration by the authority of the state. Government regularly authorised the subordination of private property rights to the public interest. From the very early years of steam railway construction in England, and this is a very early steam locomotive pictured here, arbitration clauses were included in parliamentary acts to settle disputes related to purchase of land, construction and operation of the railways, sometimes quite technical in nature, uh, but particularly relating to their status as a public utility, including their role carrying the mail and in maintaining telegraph lines. Land acquisition was, however, the most aggravated aspect of the growth of railway companies, as it placed railway capitalists in conflict with the wealth and political influence of the landed aristocracy and gentry. The passage of several pieces of consolidating legislation in 1845 saw representatives of the railway interest and the landed classes clash in Parliament over the legal form their future relationship would take. And I really think, in a sense, 1845 is a watershed moment for arbitration uh, that is much missed um, for not being included in the reforms that were much more related to the courts. 
the Land Clauses Consolidation Act was passed in 1845 and presented by Peel's government as a compromise between the needs of the landowners and the railway companies. The Act did allow railway companies to expropriate land, but in cases where the offer or claim of compensation exceeded £50, the landowner could choose to settle their claim by jury, special jury or arbitration. The arbitration could not be avoided by an action. If either party failed to appoint an arbitrator within 14 days, the single arbitrator could proceed ex parte, and if an umpire was not appointed, then the Board of Trade could make the selection. Awards could not be set aside, uh, to quote the Act, for irregularity or error in matter of form. Costs could be paid entirely Uh, Sorry, costs would be paid entirely by the railway company unless the price decided was the same or less than the initial offer that had been made. While the Lands Clauses Consolidation Act related to land taken for any undertaking of a public nature, the arbitration provisions were extended further in the special case of railway companies. The Railways Clauses Consolidation Act of 1845 also stipulated the process to be followed if any disputes were determined by arbitration, either under its own provisions or any special act pertaining to the railways. One eventuality specifically provided for was arbitration to settle compensation for injury done to mining operations on land needed for the railways. Also in 1845, the Companies Clauses Consolidation Act contained very similar provisions for a full arbitration process. Following the Land Clauses Consolidation Act, the Law Review lauded what it thought to be the first provision for compulsory arbitration. The railway press, previously favourable towards arbitration, was complaining of widespread extortion. And the confidential reports of the London and North Western Railways purchases uh, would suggest they were correct, as they expose a litany of overpayment for land. Another point of contention between the landed interest and the railway companies was the payment of rates. Local taxes, rates were collected by parishes on the rental value of properties, and at this time parishes were the smallest unit of local government. Upkeep of the local poor was by far the largest burden upon the rates. Railways passed through many rural parishes, each of which levied taxes upon the entire railway company, shifting the burden of taxation from landowners. And um, this was really something without any great legal precedent, as there hadn't been such large companies um, that covered so many parishes before. So the companies challenged this practice in the courts, but with little effect, and Parliament had little appetite for wholesale reform. The intransigence of courts and Parliament led railway companies to seek long-term negotiated settlements with parishes from around 1855, bolstered by teams of local valuators and solicitors. If agreement could not be reached, arbitration was preferred to litigation by both sides. At the end of 1845, the Times saw railway legislation as to, quote, a mass of confusion and trash, and to avoid, quoting again, unascertained and conflicting law, parties were advised to resort to arbitration instead. If their agents cannot bring the matter to a satisfactory termination, two mutual friends and an umpire is a cheaper and we feel disposed to believe a more competent tribunal than the law courts, administering most expensively a confused mass of stuff called railway laws. By all means avoid, by arbitration, the glorious uncertainty and the inglorious ruin of law proceedings. Arbitration of disputes between railway companies was increasingly included in legislation, strengthening the role of the Board of Trade as regulator, which in 1842 was authorised to arbitrate disputes between connecting railways regarding their joint traffic upon the application of either party, but only to decide the apportionment of expenses. To show how high profile and public these disputes had become, in 1851, a dispute between the London and Northwestern companies and the Midland Railway Company was referred to none other than William Ewart Gladstone, 
a future prime minister, of course, but also at that point, previously president of the Board of Trade. The railway company's disagreement concerned competition for traffic between uh, London and several northern cities, including York, Leeds and Wakefield. In 1859, the Railway Companies Arbitration Act was passed with the major innovation that if any company failed to appoint an arbitrator within 14 days of a written request, the Board of Trade would appoint one for them. The Regulation of Railways Act of 1868 allowed the Board of Trade to call upon an arbitrator in any dispute involving a railway company that it was required to decide, and could also appoint, appoint an arbitrator to decide compensation if someone was injured or killed in an accident on the railway. The Regulation of Railways Act of 1873 set up the new positions of up to three railway commissioners, one a legal profession and the other two lay members, and also two assistant commissioners. Henceforth, any difference involving a railway company that might have been referred to an arbitration could be referred to the commissioners as arbitrator or umpire, and they could rescind, vary or add to the award of a previous arbitrator. The commissioners formed what was termed a court, which attracted unfavourable commentary in an anonymous pamphlet when they were due for reappointment. The pamphlet claimed that from their appointment in 1873 until the end of 1877, the commissioners had settled an average of only 18 disputes annually, while costing nearly £10,000 in salaries. The commissioners had also sat as arbitrators in 29 cases in that time. Yet the sheer size, complexity, widespread ownership and public utility of railway companies posed a problem to legislators and the courts. And I think a particularly powerful example was the insolvency of the London, Chatham and Dover Railway in 1866. And you can see part of the network of that railway here. It resulted in a high profile arbitration which was a quintessential example of legislators' need for out-of-court dispute resolution in cases of such novelty and complexity as there was no legal provision for winding up railway companies and separating their acts until after the insolvency of the London, Chatham and Dover Railway took place. Instead, the London, Chatham and Dover Railway Arbitration Act of 1869 was passed, appointing the Marquess of Salisbury and Lord Cairns as arbitrators for their respective knowledge of the railway business and the law. The arbitrators were enabled to determine the rights of the various creditors and restructure the company as they thought fit. Their awards of 1870 and 1871 were successful at reconstituting the insolvent company as a going concern, receiving widespread plaudits for their approach, but without forming any particular precedent for future practice. That kind of interventionism was welcomed in some aspects of railway regulation, but was more complex when turned on working class organisations, which I'd like to speak a bit more about now. I could have chosen to speak about trade unions and wage bargaining here, but I thought instead I'd explore the less well-known friendly society. Friendly societies were possibly first established as early as the 16th century, spreading widely during the 18th century, and were recognised as national organisations by law in 1793. And some of them uh, that were established as far back as that uh, still exist today. They offered members a financial safety net in case of infirmity or ill health, as well as opportunities for sociability. Their importance in working class life is undeniable, as by the middle of the 19th century, their membership outstripped those of trade unions, cooperatives and methods, Methodist societies combined. The societies defended, to quote Simon Cordry, one of their uh, main historians, the philosophy of voluntarism, the principle that people's needs are best met by self-help without state intervention. The avoidance of conflict within societies was a vital aspiration to the extent that name calling and controversial topics of discussion were banned by some societies. The 1793 Act recognised friendly societies as corporate bodies and required them to verify their rules with justices of the peace, although this stipulation was not enforced. <laughs> 
the Act approved the resolution of disputes between members and the society by arbitration and the inclusion of this mechanism in society's rules. And this was quite important, uh, particularly if uh, payouts were involved, um, a, a bit like in the case of insurance companies. In accordance with the Act, some societies included an arbitration clause in their rules that allowed members to refer an arbitration to arbitration any dispute over fines, expulsion, or indeed any other matter in dispute. Although their legal status changed little following the 1793 Act, rules for the societies became increasingly standardised in the 19th century. Many cases came before magistrates. In a cause at the Guildhall in 1826, Jane Roberts challenged her removal from the membership of the Sisters of Friendship, a benefit society for women. She had been scratched from the membership for being, to quote the case, most shameful intoxicated and talking over other members. However, the magistrate found the stewardess of the society had taken the decision with no recourse to arbitration, despite a clause in the society's rules stipulating that all disputes had to be referred. The magistrate thus ordered that Roberts had to be reinstated. The Friendly Societies Act of 1829 appointed a barrister, barrister as registrar to certify rules of societies, although registration was made entirely voluntary. Societies that registered had to have rules in place to decide disputes, whether by reference to a magistrate or arbitrators. If arbitration was chosen, then a panel of arbitrators with no personal interest in the institution had to be elected with no fewer than three chosen by ballot to dispose of a dispute. If any party did not conform with the arbitrator's award, complaint could be made to a magistrate. And if the amount owed went unpaid and was less than 10 shillings, the magistrate could levy the sum and costs by distress. Another Friendly Society Act of 1846 created the new national position of Registrar of Friendly Societies and abolished local oversight. Disputes between society trustees and managers or members which had previously to be heard in court could henceforth be referred to the registrar, with disputes over sums below £20 automatically referred. From 1855, if disputes were supposed to be heard by an arbitrator, but none was appointed or no decision was made within 40 days of an appointment, the dispute would be taken to the county court, which would also enforce the decision of arbitrators. So previously mentioned, the Odd Fellows provided a case study of dispute resolution in friendly societies. They were, according to the historian Penelope Ismay, the quintessential convivial society, uh, particularly that was in their early iteration, and they developed to become one of the largest friendly societies. A lodge of Odd Fellows was started in Manchester in 1810, and by 1814 there were six, which met together that year to form a Grand Lodge Committee, and eventually became the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, Manchester Unity. This became the blueprint for a network of lodges that provided travel relief to members. The Odd Fellows tried to prevent disputes between members through rules that set out proper forms of address, also banning behaviour ranging from swearing or fighting to talking about religion or politics. Lectures were given at regular meetings that outlined how members ought to behave, illustrated with relevant stories from the Bible. Uh, it wasn't all quite so moral and austere, as when these measures failed to prevent dispute, a group of odd fellows would try to settle their differences with a drinking session, a practice they knew as proceeding to harmony. From around the 1820s, more formal dispute resolution mechanisms also became necessary, particularly as the organisation grew in size and drinking culture fell out of favour more widely. One of these mechanisms was to give members the right to present their case to the Grand Master of the Order as the final stage of their dispute settlement process. The Odd Fellows had developed a complete formal dispute resolution process by the late 1840s, and if a dispute arose, it was initially referred to what was termed a jury, elected by the lodge where the dispute uh, originated. If their award was disputed, the case could be taken to a committee formed of deputies elected by each lodge in that district. 
A final right of appeal was to the board of directors, made up of 12 directors elected at the annual movable committee, together with the grandmaster, deputy grandmaster, and uh, immediately previous ex-grandmaster. This system actually precluded them from registering under the Friendly Societies Act of 1846, as it did not conform with the Act's regulations, uh, allowing, of course, uh, members of the same organisation to act as arbitrator. And this fact was also testified to by the National Registrar. A royal commission that investigated friendly societies in 1871 to 4 heard evidence that arbitration was supported by the vast majority of members and managers of the societies, though objected to by a few members of affiliated societies. It was really in the burial societies, uh, which, as you can imagine, um, paid for the burial of members. Um, that major objections emerged as the sums in dispute tended to be small, the managers of one society tended to arbitrate the disputes of another, and there were difficulties related to the actual members being, by the nature of the claims made on this type of society, deceased. Ensuing legislation in 1875 allowed consensual references to the registrar to arbitrate. I don't think it's difficult to see why arbitration with strong elements of mediation and negotiation remained widely accepted as the form of dispute resolution for members of friendly societies. Their belief in the principles of brotherhood and mutual aid did not encourage strict observance of a rigid set of rules to the detriment of the society's wider aims of assisting and improving its members, making the equitable outcomes of arbitration well suited to their purpose. The spirit of self-help and independence made recourse to external interference of any kind unpalatable. Politicians had to balance their desire to oversee the workings of friendly societies with the strong possibility of regulating them out of existence and prompting a turn to more overtly political organisations. And this was a particularly big worry in the early 18th century. So I hope this discussion has given some insight into the way that legislators approached arbitration and has at least complicated somewhat the common story of incremental improvement. The Chief Justice of New South Wales has recently used the history of commercial arbitration to reframe current debates. He says the usual question asked is, how far ought we permit, how far ought we permit private parties to exclude determination of their dispute by a court. However, in his opinion, a reading of the history of the law relating to arbitration suggests that the question should really be, how far ought courts be willing to intervene in arbitrations between private parties? Without wishing to make any claims on how current debate should be shaped, I think the interaction of arbitration with the institutions described here, other than the courts, is both interesting and underexplored. While its relationship with law and commerce were the focus of the major legislation relating to the arbitration process, it was much more widely applied by legislators to administrative functions. A more developed understanding of that wider application of arbitration amongst legal historians and perhaps even policymakers is made more important by the fact that it was not much remarked upon as it happened. The examples I have taken here of arbitration facilitating large transfers of land, both from common ownership to private and from aristocrats to companies, arbitration being used to navigate novel and complex disputes concerning railway companies, and arbitration deciding disputes in working class organisations, give, give just a very small taste of the wide range of historical applications in which legislators intervened, although often after the fact. One common thread is the creation of officials and commissioners who could act as arbitrators, sometimes developing directly from the role of arbitrator. From official referees to the Registrar of Friendly Societies, their arbitration services were generally offered, but rarely imposed. I hope that the wider ecosystem I have described is proof enough that the form and practice of arbitration has not just been a matter of contention between London lawyers and commercial men. And I do think um, uh, pointing out that the debate does need to range further than London and that arbitration is not at all a London centric process is a, a kind of important point to make. 
Uh, it was certainly a concern for the barrister presiding over arbitration proceedings in the royal courts of justice, but also the group of odd fellows proceeding to harmony in their Manchester tavern. Thank you for listening. And thank you very much, Francis, for a, a really uh, rich and uh, uh, complex picture of, of the history of arbitration. And it's great to see that the uh, research project is continuing apace and uh, the progress that's being made. Um, I, I should announce also that the uh, recording of this seminar will be published uh, on the Institute website uh, for anyone who missed uh, any of the, uh, uh, any part of it. So it will be published uh, on our website. Now, um, a question uh, that's been asked, uh, which you can take as a, a compliment, uh, Francis, uh, and an opportunity to talk a bit about um, outputs. Um, will uh, the paper be published? What are your uh, intentions in terms of publications? This is an opportunity for a complete self-promotion on your part. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you very much for that question. It's a, a wonderful one to be given. But um, uh, it, it won't be published as a distinct paper, I don't think. But um, the big uh, outputs of uh, the arbitration project is very much uh, to write a book that will be the final one in um, Derek Roebuck's incredible series published by Holo Books. Um, I helped with the 18th century volume, um, but the uh, the output of this project is very much to put together a 19th century volume. Um, and uh, the research that I've been doing for that um, is very much the background for all of the things that I've been speaking about today. So um, I hope really that there will be longer sections and all these things um, uh, in that book. And those will all be kind of tied together and contextualized um, rather a lot more in there as well. Um, though I do have a paper coming out on arbitration in the theatre later this year, so do look out for that. Uh, and I should also invite our uh, audience members to uh, submit questions and comments in the Q&A function uh, at any time. I want to use the, the chair's prerogative, though, to, to get the uh, that conversation started, just to ask you to give us a bit of more flavor of who the arbitrators were uh, as a if there if there is any commonality uh, that can be obviously there's going to be a vast difference between you know you you sketched out everything from railways to friendly societies. Uh, was there emerging a kind of a professional um, role of arbitrator in this period? Yeah, well, that is something that I've written about. Um, and an excellent book was brought out in Derek Roebuck's memory uh, last year, also published by Holo Books. And myself and Rhiannon Markless uh, looked at exactly this question. Um, it certainly did change over time. Um, and there certainly was a, um, a process of uh, professionalization and legalization of the role of arbitrator. Um, so I'd say uh, very early on, um, pre the 1698 Arbitration Act, uh, the presumption uh, was that you would choose an arbitrator probably known by both parties, um, also probably someone who was higher in social class than them. Um, so that there wasn't necessarily any need to turn to uh, the courts or any kind of state power um, for an enforcement of the arbitration award. Really, a lot of the, the heavy lifting with that was done by uh, the arbitrator being someone of certainly at least equal or higher social class. So um, that might particularly be in a, a local dispute, say, over land boundaries. Um, in that case, their, their kind of local cachet uh, would bring a lot to the, the process itself. Um, that definitely sort of moved on uh, over the centuries. And um, more and more, there was an expectation of uh, the arbitrator having some kind of legal knowledge and working to some kind of uh, legal norm. Um, although that really, of course, depended in, in the kind of area uh, that the arbitration was taking place. Um, many specialist areas uh, sort of built up um, and many of them are uh, still 
uh, very much the case today, say something like construction, uh, you really needed someone who had experience of the building trade. Um, and particularly uh, at a time uh, when an arbitration was set up for each person to choose their own arbitrator and for those two arbitrators to choose an umpire, um, it would very much be the case that um, each party would choose uh, someone they trusted who, to some extent, worked as an advocate for them, although uh, they were also hoping for um, someone who was, uh, in quotes, indifferent. At the time, that didn't mean uh, lacking in interest, um, but more that they were um, kind of uh, able and willing to act as an impartial judge to some extent, um, in the hope that the two arbitrators um, could themselves negotiate a settlement, hopefully without moving things on uh, to the umpire. Um, as you move through the 18th century, uh, there came to be an expectation amongst some arbitrators uh, that they would get paid, although there was still horror from others um, who kind of saw this uh, very much as a um, uh, something that they should offer as, as a kind of citizen, as a member of any kind of um, uh, the wider society, but also, say, particular commercial groups. Um, but as you got into the 19th century, um, the expectation of payment um, and of perhaps being a, a professional to some extent became more and more the norm. And um, by the late 19th century, um, you were very much seeing uh, disputes without a, a technical or trade element um, being almost entirely taken over by the legal profession and in particular by barristers, which I, I find it kind of ironic that there was this big complaint amongst the legal profession um, that uh, turning to a barrister might cause delay because um, they might not have sufficient time and interest uh, to um, give to an arbitration. Um, I guess from that point of view, it's kind of interesting that um, yeah, one of the complaints was that arbitration was becoming slower and slower, um, but in a way that was being uh, kind of bottlenecked by uh, referring all of it to to the legal profession. So, yeah, definite um, kind of big changes over time. Um, but some of the uh, qualities that were looked for in an arbitrator remained. And I think that's particularly in terms of uh, specialism in some subjects. But what also I thought was found interesting is this relationship that must have emerged been emerging between the arbitrators uh, chosen by parties and then the umpire um, do you have any insights on that yeah well I suppose um they would I also look to someone um within their field um some people uh, became um kind of increasingly professional in being repeatedly chosen as an arbitrator or umpire. Um, so even in some cases of um, sort of more working class examples um, amongst, say, weavers, uh, some people would be called on so much they had to charge for their time um, because they were just finding that they were unable to get on with uh, their main trade of um, weaving or, or whatever that may be. Um, so from that point of view, um, being chosen as an umpire, if it happened repeatedly, um, was in itself a, a sort of form of professionalization um, because so much of their time was being taken up by it uh, that they could no longer afford to really do it on an amateur basis. Great. Question from our, our audience now about the friendly societies. Uh, asking if if the friendly societies had any had relationships or connections with lodges of the Freemasons, um, not necessarily uh, official connections as such, but there were certainly a lot of similarities. Um, they were sort of m more and largely working class organisations. Although um, I understand some friendly societies became much wider in their membership and uh, Gladstone who was uh, mentioned there was a member of one uh, the order of foresters if I remember correctly um, so uh, there were a lot of kind of parallels between them in terms of a sort of broad-based membership with elements of sociability and some of them had kind of um, sort of secretive rituals um, or ways of, of members identifying other members through uh, kind of ritualistic practices, um, but uh, not as far as I know any kind of um, necessarily official links in that they had very slightly uh, different um, kind of aims 
attached to them with the friendly societies offering that that sort of um, uh, insurance element to them as well. A uh, question f- uh, from uh, Professor Catherine McMillan, uh, who asks, uh, well, first of all, she says quite rightly, thank you for an excellent paper. I, am, I very much enjoyed it. One thing I wondered is whether or not you see a link between arbitration and arbitrators on the one hand and various nonconformist religious groups who employ arbitration-like mechanisms to resolve disputes within their communities without going to law. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, it's a really, really interesting area. Um, the Quakers in particular were known for their attachment to arbitration. Um, that had been uh, something that was uh to their mind, um, uh, kind of biblically and morally prescribed. And they created an arbitration institution um, very much within their own organisation as a a kind of way of um, uh, creating discipline um, to some extent between Quakers. Uh, So if at one point, if you refuse to go to law as a Quaker, um, then you could be um, thrown out of uh, the uh, kind of Quaker group that you were a part of. Um, that became less and less of a formal uh, mechanism, and uh, certainly they became less disciplinary into the 19th century, um, which is something that I'm looking into now. Um, but at the same time, it uh, became a big movement uh, amongst the, the Quakers and other dissenters um, to institute a, a sort of regime of international arbitration. So the idea of um, international peace, uh, quite pertinent on a day like today, I suppose, um, through a system of international arbitration became something, an, a, a big cause that uh, dissenters became um, major backers behind. And uh, that long centuries worth of arbitration in their own organisation uh, must certainly have given them um, a kind of experience, expertise, um, and indeed a um, a moral belief uh, in that way of ending disputes, um, both both sort of interpersonally, but between nations. And um, there's been some really good and ongoing research about uh, the Quakers and whether um, they became renowned as as sort of traders and merchants from the 18th century onwards. And um, there's been some research into whether arbitration between them gave them a competitive advantage in that area. Um, and that kind of leads nicely into our next uh, question from Victor Chimwanda, uh, one of our Isles uh, graduates, um, which wonders if if you've looked at all um, as a through a comparative dimension to this project, uh, looking at how arbitration uh, has developed developed in other jurisdictions. There is not necessarily a comparative element to my own work in that um, just looking at British arbitration has been uh, kind of work enough to keep me busy uh, for several years. Um, But it's certainly something I'm interested in um, and something that others are working on and that there's some uh, sort of fascinating things that you can read about. Um, Christian Bursett is one um, who is Sorry about that. Uh, lost inter- um, internet so, connection for a moment. <laughs> uh, you were just uh, part way through your discussion of you had started mentioning some of the other research out there on comparative dimensions. Ah, yes, not, not sure where I was lost, but um, uh, certainly Christian Bassett is looking into um, comparative dimensions of research um, across um, the Atlantic world. So um, looking at arbitration in the States and how that developed differently to in Britain um, once that had become independent and indeed as a colony. And in fact, uh, myself, Christian and Catherine McMillan are organising a symposium this October at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies um, to look into more comparative questions. So if anyone has uh, potential papers, uh, we are looking for um, those to be submitted at the moment. So do please look that out online. Um, In terms of Africa, uh, I've been a long-time correspondent uh, with Justice Edward Torgbor, who's doing um, really interesting research into the history of arbitration across the African continent, Um, and I think publishing that in a book 
uh, reasonably soon. So uh, do look out for that one if you're interested in uh, arbitration in Africa. And a brilliant segue uh, there, uh, Francis, to the uh, to your upcoming workshop at Isles. Uh, <laughs> nicely plugged. Thanks. Uh, Good opportunity. <laughs> we have a, a comment from uh, your colleague uh, Rhiannon. Uh, we have the call for papers has uh, gone into the chat function. If anyone's interested, a comment from uh, your colleague Rhiannon Marklis, uh, who adds that in her research of 19th century records of the higher tier courts. Uh, She's finding varied examples socially and geographically of private individuals entering into agreements to arbitrate uh, from the will of a wealthy heiress in London to to colliery owners in West Yorkshire and Wales and a Welsh farm owner. So that's really, um, uh, really interesting. Thanks for that insight, Rhiannon. did the another interesting question did the development of mediation take place in parallel with the development of arbitration um what's an, i'm really inviting you to uh, comment on the relationship between the, the two in the 19th century there's some fine distinctions here from what i could hear yeah i think that's a really interesting question um particularly as um when both were um a little bit less legalized and regulated uh, there was very much more um fluid movement between the two um so even today um many arbitrations might have started uh with a mediation um and indeed with a negotiation and um in uh many kind of disputes the further back you go um that would be a much more fluid process whereby um because it was less uh, official um you could move up from negotiation to mediation arbitration possibly back again uh to mediation um and uh, there wasn't so much of a uh, a kind of um official definitional distinction between them um i guess that did grow up uh as the 19th century wore on um the sort of idea of an official mediator um, was not necessarily one um, that uh, would have been conceived of other than having a a lawyer that you paid regularly and that they would kind of act as um, a mediator because they were someone you looked to for advice, um, perhaps even uh, a kind of estate manager or someone like that to the aristocracy. Um, They might act as a mediator, but certainly unofficial mediators were absolutely everywhere um, at all times in history. Um, And naturally, as two friends in dispute might look to a third friend um, to just be able to offer a a cool head and a restating of um, the arguments each made, um, mediators were in all kind of groups and um, at all levels of society operating um, from the uh, reverend in the parish church very often um, to the the magistrate and justice of the peace. Um, Certainly in business communities, um, mediators uh, were always operating, attempting to bring um, their fellow merchants uh, to a a kind of sensible conclusion if a dispute arose. Um, And often that mediation could then be escalated into an arbitration where a more adjudicative um, outcome was expected, um, but without necessarily um, in the earlier years any um, sort of official change to the process taking place. Um, Sometimes that was just uh, a kind of... um, orally put across, whereas later on, um, there would be much more um, signing of, um, as we discussed, uh, bonds and things like that, um, and a bit more of a um, an official process put in place. Apart from anything else, uh, stamp duty became an important factor. Um, so you had to pay stamp duty on both arbitration bonds and awards. Um, and that meant that um, there was a, a kind of automatically um, officialization of uh, the process of arbitration because you had to get your um, 
your form stamped and taxed. And um, if you didn't, you were breaking kind of state laws. So it's a very interesting, um, almost accidental um, uh, aspect to the legalization of arbitration that as things became taxed, um, they immediately became um, a lot more legalized and a lot more official in many ways. A uh, comment from John Pointing, who, who notes that from the 1880s, surveyors acted as arbitrators, and the president yeah. of the surveyors institution would appoint one if the parties couldn't agree. So that's an interesting insight as well. Yeah, I think um, very interesting with both uh, surveyors and valuators, um, the kind of technical distinction between um, valuators and arbitrators grew up in the 19th century. But yeah, certainly um, professionals like surveyors and architects um, came to kind of take over from um, trades like builders and woodworkers and stonemasons um, who would have been the arbitrators of the 18th century. Of course, that still happened um, in many cases where where that technical aspect of building came up. But the, the more professional professionalized um, uh, groups like surveyors and architects really became uh, a lot more of a, a sort of an, an official occupation in the 19th century. Um, and indeed, as as you say, sort of grouped into um, trade organizations, which then kind of provided them as arbitrators. So yeah, that was certainly something that um, uh, drove um, the, the sort of movement to officialism. Uh, now, a couple of questions from uh, David Sugarman. So, so get ready, Francis. Uh, your, first, your first question. Uh, Chris Brooks argued that law was more important to ordinary people and society in the late 16th century and early 17th centuries than in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. Does your work confirm or challenge this thesis? Well, I wouldn't dare argue with Chris Brooks on the law side of thing. Um, I think that uh, in a way uh, it runs parallel to that, that law could become easier or harder to use um, for uh, the average man or woman. Um, but the arbitration always sat both as an adjunct to that, um, but also, I think, as a largely separate process earlier on. And I think that's a, a really important thing to acknowledge that um, often it was the, the kind of reverend or indeed magistrate offering arbitration services, but without really much interest um, in the way that that interacted with the law. And that even goes for the magistrate. You know, sometimes um, they would produce arbitration operations of it uh, ran against the law that they were simultaneously upholding. Um, but if they saw that as a more fair and equitable uh, way of doing things, um, then uh, when they had a bit less interaction between centre and periphery, I suppose, um, and uh, particularly in uh, more part of the uh, ability to access things like the assizes, um, certainly there would have been a lot more uh, kind of informal justice. Um, a lot of that carried on, but I think there had to be a slightly more um, definite process by which the law, so something like the friendly societies where um, the working classes um, were wanting to decide things for themselves and um, not invite uh, the uh, state to intervene particularly. Um, so I th that's the one thing that I would say is that um, an official legalised process um, became much more um, normalised and expected um, the later you get, um, but that uh, many groups still preferred a less official, less legalised one um, in which they could use arbitration much more informally, um, but there had to be um, an expectation amongst all the parties that they were doing so as you get later and later. Uh, otherwise, um, there was much more power for one party um, to draw the the dispute into the orbit of the courts. And uh, the second part of uh, second day of David's questions, 
How should we theorize the history of arbitration as you've described it? You seem to adopt the typical historian strategy of arguing that it was uh, all more complex and nuanced than is usually recognized in the historiography, um, which David says is almost certainly true. But if it's not a story of evolutionary functionalism or Weberian uh, rationalization or capture or laissez-faire, how do we theorize that that history? Or should we just give up on theorizing it? Um, well, I hope I didn't come across as too much of a cop-out, and I hope that we needn't quite give up. Um, I suppose that I do see that there was a strong process of legalization um, and I do agree with Douglas Yarn in terms of um, that process of legalization losing something at the mean in the meantime, um, but the, at the same time um, they're continuing uh, kind of non-official processes of alternative dispute resolution. Um, so I think in some senses it is useful to look at it in. Um, a variety of different spheres and look at the way different groups um, managed and used arbitration and created a more or less uh, legalized forms. And I suppose um, then separate out commercial arbitration and look at the ways that that was legalized, think about whether that did uh, improve in terms of enforcement, look at how Welcome back, Francis. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, you you wanted to buy a little time to finish thinking about your answer to David's uh, second question. You were right in the middle of talking about how um, I think we have to look at kind of a sector approach, um, and that uh, you were you hadn't copped out. <laughs> Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, it definitely, um, whilst panicking and trying to get the internet back, I was able to think a little more about, uh, yeah, the idea of, I suppose, the sector by sector approach um, being an attempt to separate out arbitration as a process with so many different facets and not being in any way um, the kind of um, uh, monolithic process that is sometimes um, rather... Um, it problematically conceived of when we look at it only through the prism of commercial arbitration um, and court back to arbitration. Um, I think there's certainly room for um, looking at the ways in which it changed and which it did legalize, le legalize and thinking about the things that were lost in that process, but then also looking at the ways um, that other organizations, apart from uh, lawyers and commercial men, um, also kind of changed it in different ways and maybe continued to use it more informally um, and didn't. Uh, any final comments to, to David's uh, question? Um, I, I'm not sure quite what you got in the last of that, but yeah, just, just really to say the idea of um, kind of looking at arbitration in the round and yeah. um, accepting that there are a few more strands to its use um, than has previously been the case. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, were agreements to refer future disputes common during this period? Uh, hugely common. Um, the, the major examples are very much in um, partnerships um, and in insurance. Um, often um, when you signed an insurance contract or you signed uh, kind of contracted into a partnership in any business, um, you would agree to uh, send any future disputes uh, to arbitration, although it was very questionable about um, how um, enforceable those actually were. And um, that became a, a kind of important matter at common law, um, which uh, very much went back and forth over the 18th and 19th centuries. And finally, uh, one final question for you, and then we'll, we'll let you go. And it's a, it's a uh, Nasty question to ask, <laughs> okay. to ask a historian, uh, but it invites you to um, give any insights that you've, de you've developed, any personal views uh, about the future of arbitration uh, from Lasso. What, what insights about the future have you uh, 
discovered from looking at the past? I think that is one that I genuinely will cop out on, um, on the basis that I am eminently um, poorly, uh, poorly trained and poorly suited um, to give uh, any kind of crystal ball answers to what the future of arbitration uh, will be. Um, I suppose I really hope that my research um, might be used by others in the future um, to more think, rethink uh, how the past of arbitration has developed um, and then perhaps uh, take that to rethink how we've gotten to where we are. But really the future is uh, something I will leave to um, the arbitrators themselves. Well, I think on that note, that's a, a very diplomatic answer uh, to the question. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Francis, for dealing with uh, uh, technical challenges. Uh, but uh, it's been a really fascinating and informative uh, discussion, um, a really rich and deeply textured paper. Once again, I would like to thank not only you, but I'd also like to thank the donors uh, to the Arbitration Project for making this research possible. Uh, we're very grateful. I'd like to also thank our audience for joining us today. Thank you for your patience uh, when we lost uh, contact with Francis briefly. Um, thank you for a, a terrific array of questions. Um, and I hope you um, enjoyed the conversation. Our next seminar in the director's series will be on the 23rd of March at 1600 GMT, and I hope you will join me then. Uh, but until then, once again, let me thank you, Francis. Uh, it's goodbye from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. Thanks very much, Francis. Thank you.